Thank you all very much for coming, and it's a great honor for me to be here with you. I saw what you're up against two days ago <coughs> in Stuttgart, and many people have been coming up to me since then and saying, I'm so sorry, and I'm so embarrassed, and I didn't uh, expect that this would happen, and uh, it was very terrible. But actually, uh, I thought it was great and that it was a victory and you should all be very proud. And this is very important to understand because the main thing that they want to do is frighten you <coughs> into and intimidate you into being too afraid to do anything, too afraid to act, too afraid to stand up against this. And so this was a very violent and dangerous situation there was a young man there who said to me, you're lucky that there's so many police right here, or you know, he, would, uh, he would take care of the situation himself. But we stood firm, and we did have the event. And we showed them that they're not going to stop us. And this is very important, not only from the standpoint of not backing down in the face of violent intimidation, which is essential, but it also is the only thing that we can possibly do to face down the Islamic supremacists. And that's the only thing that they understand as a defeat. So, in Islamic theology, in the Quran, if you obey Allah, you will prosper in this world. If you obey Allah, then things will go right for you. This is a very simple equation. If you are a pious, obedient Muslim, then you will have prosperity and success in this world. Now you see, this is fundamentally different from the Judeo-Christian tradition. And if you are familiar with the Psalms and the idea of why do the wicked prosper, it is all through the Hebrew scriptures, the Christian scriptures, it is all through them that sometimes good people don't win and sometimes the evil do prosper. But in Islam, there is no such idea. In Islam, when Muhammad took the Muslims out to fight the Quraysh, the pagan Arabs, they were outnumbered by four times, 300 to 1200, and they defeated the Quraysh. And the Quran is very clear. You, you didn't win, win that victory. I won that victory, Allah says. I was fighting for you. And later when they lost, they didn't lose, but it was a draw, that they didn't win. And Muhammad got his teeth knocked out at the Battle of Uhud. It, the Quran is clear again. You did not win because you were not pious enough. You were not obeying a law, you lost. And so, there is in Islam the imperative to make those who are considered to be disobedient to a law to suffer. And this is why there's the whole superstructure in Islam of dimitude, of the subjugation of the non-Muslims. Because they have rejected Allah and Muhammad, they have to suffer in this world. And the Muslims have to have a special status, special rights, be a special class above them because this is the natural order of things that the good will prosper and the evil will suffer. So, the Muslims look around the world and they see that they are not prospering. And this has two effects. Nowadays, we see that it's creating a great fanaticism because one of the aspects of religion is whatever religion you may be, this is not a criticism of religion, but it's just a fact, you can always do more. You can always look at yourself and say, well, I really could be praying more, I could be reading the holy book more, I could be doing more, I could be giving more to the poor, whatever. If you are of the mindset that the difficulties you're having in your life are because you, the, dis, the, the, the wicked do not prosper, then that can create a very great fanaticism. 
and you become more and more and more fervent in your religion. And if your religion is violent and supremacist, then you become a jihad terrorist. Or it can do another thing. That if you, the, you see that in your life it's not working and you are being very pious and observant and you're not prospering, you might start to question your premises. And so, this comes back to where I began. We stood firm against great intimidation and great odds and danger. And so, they lost. And when they lose, it messes up their mind. They have no way to understand that. And it is a repudiation of their fundamental premise. That they are the believers, they are the best of people, and they are obedient to a law, and we are not, and we're in active rebellion against the law. And yet, they didn't stand us down. And so it was a great victory. So I urge you, in the face of these things, not to uh, be disheartened, but to be encouraged and to continue. It's very important at this point that you continue to have public meetings. And I know it's very difficult, yes, but you show them that you're not going to stop, you're not going to give up, and that there is no way you're going to retreat on this. And I understand the risks, I understand the difficulties, and I understand that not everyone will be able to do that. But if we do not, then we know the alternative. We know what will happen. We know it's already happening. And we know that the political elites in Europe and America, I increasingly think, they want this. They want Islamization. Because if they didn't want it, they, uh, they could do something to stop it. But everything they do is to foster it. And everything they do is to keep it going. But there's an increasing gap between the people and the elites. And if you continue to have a public presence, I am absolutely certain that more people will join you and it will be very much more difficult for them to shut all this down. <clears throat> the process of Islamization is already, of course, very advanced. And we are now entering into a different stage of it. And we saw this two days ago. In the Quran, there are three stages of development, as many of you no doubt know, in the doctrine of jihad. And the first is when Muhammad first became a prophet and began to preach in Mecca that he was the new prophet of the one true God. Most people paid no attention. He got a small band of followers together. The Quraysh, Muhammad was a member of the tr tribe of the Quraysh. They were the pagan Arabs in Mecca. And the Quraysh leaders did not like what he was saying at all because it challenged them. They had the Kaaba, which was there at that time too, before Islam. And it was full of idols, 360 pagan idols. And the Arabs from all over Arabia would go there to venerate their gods. So the Quraysh had a... They had a shrine, you know, if you've ever been to Rome or Jerusalem or uh, Fatima or Lourdes, you know, it's a big tourist trap. And so was Mecca and the Kaaba. So they didn't like that Muhammad was preaching that there was only one God and all these other gods were nothing and that they should not be worshipped because the Quraysh believed then that that would cut into their livelihood. Muhammad ultimately did not do that by making it into a Muslim shrine. But in any case, <clears throat> at that time, he taught tolerance and peace. And whenever you see the Imams on television preaching tolerance and peace, they are quoting from the parts of the Quran that were revealed to Muhammad at a time when he was weak and his enemies were strong. And he had no political or military power. So he was not actually preaching tolerance and peace of non-Muslims. He was asking for tolerance and peace for them. He was asking to be tolerated. Same as what happens now. Precisely. That's the stage that we are in now in Europe and America. See, you may know that the stages of the jihad in the Quran 
work chronologically. And that the, in, the, in Islam there is the doctrine of abrogation in which something that is contradicted by something that is revealed later, oh, the, later uh, the later statement overrules the earlier one. But the earlier one is not necessarily cancelled altogether. It's still in the Quran. When Muhammad moved to Medina and became a political and military leader, then he began to teach defensive jihad, that the Muslims could take up arms to defend themselves against their enemies. And in practice, this was aggressive and offensive. He ordered the, uh, the Muslims to raid the ca caravans of the Quraysh. And this was the occasion of the first battle between the two. And then he began to preach offensive jihad, which was to make war against the unbelievers and to subjugate them simply by virtue of the fact that they were unbelievers. But those stages only came when he began to get military and political power. Now, the offensive jihad takes precedence over the others. And those, those statements abrogate the statements of tolerance. However, when the Muslims are in the same position that Muhammad was in in Mecca, then the same conditions prevail. So in other words, when there's a small group of Muslims without political or military power, then they preach tolerance and peace. Just like Muhammad did when he was a small group in Mecca and didn't have political or military power. When they begin to gain military and political power, then they become more aggressive. I believe we are now moving from the first stage to the second stage in Europe and in America to a lesser degree. And that ultimately there will of necessity come the third stage as well. And this will be open warfare. It's a very sad situation, but if we stand down now, then the game is already over. And so at this point, even just to continue to have a public presence, we'll show them you're not afraid, which is what they want to do, is to frighten you, to strike terror into your hearts, as the Quran directs and that you're going to continue. And even that, as I explained, will create confusion for them because they have no, no capacity to understand that kind of a situation. They don't understand infidels who will not be intimidated, will not submit.